good morning and thank you for joining us whether you've joined us here in the building or whether you've joined us online but we're glad you have joined us before we begin the service i just have an announcement it's going to bounce us forward one week uh, could you make a special point you'll want to make a special point of joining us next week whether you come in person or whether you join us online that we are having a special service and that we are doing uh, christian baptism for linda o our linda o is going to be baptized next week so that's going to be a wonderful time and i would encourage you that if you're not if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar with christian baptism baptism as a believer i would encourage you join us and join in for this time it's a very exciting service and a great day of uh, celebration that we will have so join us next week for that as we come to worship today i come to psalm 100 Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know the Lord is God. It is he who made us, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He has indeed made us, and a part of why he has made us is so that we might worship him. Let us join our hearts together in worship today. Please bow as I lead us in prayer. Fathers, we come now, we come to worship, worship you. We offer this as an expression to say, bless you, Lord, we can bless you. You've given us the ability by placing your love within us to bring blessing to you. So would you be blessed this morning, Lord, with this sacrifice of worship to you. We pray in Christ's precious name, amen. Good morning. I invite you to stand up. It's always a great day when we're able to, to gather together and worship the Lord together. So I invite you to stand, if you're able, as we worship the Lord together.
good oh so good we can look around the world today and say all we see is problems we see sickness we see natural disasters we see human caused disasters and we can say all we see is problems but we see that you are good even the psalmist when he calls out to you he says my enemies surround me but there you are lord you're with me you will never leave me nor forsake me father thank you for your goodness would you help us to show your goodness to others in difficult times, in trying times, help us to show your good, whether it's an expression of your love, whether it's an expression of your care, whether it's an expression of whatever aspect of your character, Father, that you want us to show to others, to show that you are good, good, oh, so good. We indeed pray for those down in Haiti who have been struck by the, the earthquake down there, and Father, just time after time that country gets hit. We pray for provision to be made provision to be made in a supernatural way to help them for the, the people who are doing the rescue work and the people who are doing the rebuilding and all that down there, Father, would you give them strength? Would you cause the people to turn to you in an even greater way? Lord, we, we see this uh, hurricane coming to the East Coast and we pray, pray for protection against that. We see, Father, some man-made disasters too when we see what's happening in Afghanistan. And it's heart-wrenching, Father, when we see people clinging to airplanes as they take off. It breaks our heart. There are times I admit, Father, when we call out, we say, where are you, O God? Where is your goodness? Where is it? Why don't you intercede? But, Father, in your good and perfect and pleasing will, you know all that is going on. And you are providing just as you see is best in any given situation. Father, we could easily excuse ourselves and say, well, we're on the other side of the world. But if there's anything that we can do, Father, show that to us and give us the power and the strength to be able to do that. 
We continue to pray for the COVID situation, Father, and now they're talking about a fourth wave. I've heard people say, does anybody know what's going on? And maybe we don't know what's going on. It shows, you, shows us how, how you have made our bodies and knit them together and how so utterly dependent on you are. We thank you for knowledge. We thank you for skill. We thank you for technology that helps us in these situations. But this COVID virus shows us just how utterly dependent on you are. we are on you for each and every breath that we take. So, Father, in your goodness, continue to give us breath. So we might breathe praise to you and honor to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. I had a double blessing this morning with that singing. So I had the privilege when they sing earlier before most of us get here, I get to listen to it and I get to listen to it now. Jeffrey and Tim, there you are. Thank you so much for allowing the Lord to use you in that way for us today. And could we just do it again and then I quit here? Can we just do it again and then I'll stop here? <laughs> I think Jeffrey thought I was serious. <laughs> do that. Well, today we are in the fifth of our series of messages that are taking us through is one another, showing us what we need to be doing with one another and what we need to be caring for, how we need to be caring for one another. Previously, we had considered loving one another, encouraging one another. We looked at one week, we even looked at how they greeted each one another with a kiss. And last week, we looked at teaching and admonishing one another. Well, this morning, we are going to consider the matter of serving one another and what it means to serve one another. And if you have a Bible with you, I would encourage you to open it to a digital copy or a hard paper copy. If you would open that to, Proverbs, sorry, to Mark chapter 10, verse 35. Mark chapter 10. Verse 35. This is an account where James and John approach Jesus. Now, if we read this in Matthew's account of chapter 20 of Matthew, it says that James and John's mother, that we know their father was Zebedee, and their mother was a, a part of the conversation as well. But here in Mark, we just have it as James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They came to Jesus and they said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do Jesus, for you, Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory. You don't know what you were asking, said Jesus. Said. Can you drink the cup I drink and be baptized or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink of the cup I drink and baptize with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been for who they, whom they've been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, "You know that those who are, are regarded as rulers of, of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first." must be slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for man. Here we've got this scene, this picture here, where we've got James and John, and as I said in Matthew's account, it says their mother is on the scene too, and they approach Jesus, and they ask Jesus to do for them whatever they want him to do. Stop and think about that for a minute. Just think about that for a minute. Now, granted, they didn't fully realize who Jesus was. They had a And in their mind, he was going to be an earthly Messiah. He was going to take out earthly kings and earthly rulers and earthly government and set himself up on earth. So they didn't have a full picture. But still, they understood enough about Jesus to know he was the Messiah. And they went to him, and the first thing they say, would you do whatever we want you to do? Now, stop and think about that for a minute while they do that. Though they may not realize fully who Jesus is, they realize him enough that the respect he should be shown and they go to him. It would be the same as me if I, if I went to the mayor of Brantford or even the premier of Ontario or the prime minister of Canada and said, hey, I was just wondering, would you do for me whatever I want? 
I'd have to be crazy, and I think any of us would have enough common sense, or at least I hope we would have enough common sense not to do that. But for some reason, James and John, they approached Jesus and said, would you do anything I want? Anything I ask? And notice how Jesus responds there. When, when, when they do that, when, when he says that, Jesus answers them and see, he says, what do you want me to do? He throws the door open. He bursts the door wide open. He says, what do you want me to do? And look at when Jesus says that. To me, it's kind of a, a, a shocker. I, I might have expected Jesus to say, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know what this is? But no, Jesus opens the door wide open and he says, tell me, what, what is it you want? And no James and John's request that one of us sit at your right and one of us sit at your left in glory. Just a small request. Just a minor thing that they approach him with. <laughs> by, by the way, I was just thinking, is there a chance, if you're going to be number one, could we be number two and number three? See, they, they didn't know what was going to be set up. They didn't know what God's kingdom was going to be like. They were still picturing an earthly kingdom, and they thought these earthly rulers and these earthly government were going to be wiped out, and there'd be the throne set up for Jesus, the Messiah, to sit on, and they, he'd be on the throne, and one could be at his right, and one could be at his left to do that, and they could be number two and number three as they did that. And notice how Jesus responds to them a second time. He says, can you drink of the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. If you think things were absurd before, they're ridiculous now. They moved to what Jesus says because basically Jesus is saying to them, can you suffer like I'm going to suffer? Can you minister like I'm going to minister? Proverbs chapter 10 verse 19 says, where words abound, sin is not absent. This. I talk a lot, therefore I sin a lot. I talk a lot, therefore I sin a lot. Where words are abound, sin is not absent. I like how the New Living Translation puts that verse. Too much talk leads to sin, but be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Up until this point, James and John have not followed Proverbs chapter 10, verse 18. They should have at least at this point taken the time when Jesus asked them, can you suffer like I'm going to suffer? Can you minister like I'm going to minister? And he says to them, and he, uh, what do they do? Instead of keeping their mouth shut, they respond and they go, well, yep, I think we can do that. We can suffer like you. We can minister like you. And Jesus responds in verse 39, what he says there, well, you will drink of that cup. And you will be baptized with the baptism I've been baptized in. I can just, in my mind, almost picture Jesus talking out of the side of his mouth with a lowered voice and maybe even a bit of a wry chuckle in his breath, in his voice when he, when he says this about, you don't know how you're going to suffer. And it's speculated that James himself was martyred. Not, no, James was martyred, but it's speculated that John was boiled in oil. He survived that and he went on to, to, to uh, be exiled to the island of Patmos as he was there. The suffering that they had. But he also said, and you have no idea how the Holy Spirit is going to fill you and how the Holy Spirit is going to enable you and how you will be able to minister. You have no idea. Because Jesus knew what was coming. Jesus knew when he was ascending into heaven how the Holy Spirit would come upon those first believers and empower them to spread the word, to spread the message, and start the church, and have the church flourish when it first started. But they, in their ignorance, they pipe up and they say, well, yep, I think we can do that. Well, somehow the other ten disciples get word of this, whether they're in earshot or whether someone will always say, hey, you should see what's going on over there. Like, you, you catch a load of this. You wouldn't believe what they're asking him. Like, they're so foolish, we don't know how it happened. But somehow, the, 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 the other ten disciples, they get word of what's happening. They get word of what's happening, and they're, as the uh, scripture tells us, it, it says indignant. It means they're angered, they're possibly outraged, they're annoyed, they're irate, is what the dictionary tells me that indignant means. And maybe rightfully so, they're upset. Here they've served alongside James and John, and they said, who do you think you are? 
to get the privileged position? Or who do you think you are approaching the teacher in this way? But whatever it is, they're upset with it. And Jesus interjects in this, and he highlights to all of the disciples, all 12 of the disciples, he says, you know, when you look around you and you see the rulers of the, of the Gentiles around you, and you see how they rule with authority and their, their oppressive leaders, that's not what it's like in my kingdom. That's not what it's like. He tells them, he, he tells them straight out, he says, in my kingdom, it's different. You flip that upside down. You don't have power. You don't have authority over people when you, when you serve them. You need to be one who's willing to serve. You need to be one who's willing to serve. I want you to think out loud with me for a second. How many of you remember the old full-service gas stations? Remember the old full-service? few of us are too embarrassed to admit we're old enough for that still. <laughs> and a few of us are young enough to say, what in the world are you talking about? What were some of the things we used to get at the old full-service gas stations? They used to wash your windshield. They used to wash your windshield? Check your oil. Check your oil. Pump your gas. Pump your gas. Fix, your car. Fix your car. Check your oil and tires. Maybe wipe the wipe the headlights for you, check the washer fluid, see how that was topped up and out, or the antifreeze and see how that, that was full service. Now what's full service? Full service today, if there's still any full service gas stations around, full service today would be they'll pump your gas, they'll take your money and you're gone. <laughs> That's full service, it's changed to do that. There was a time when many of us used to go to church we used to go to church and we'd show up at church and we'd look forward to singing the songs that we liked. We'd look forward to hearing the choir that had been prepared. We'd look forward to the preacher praying over us and the pastor praying over us and blessing us. We'd look forward to what we got out of that service. We'd look forward to what our children could get out of our program and we'd have that. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself. But somehow the transition needs to change. And in many times the transition has not changed. We may do ministry differently. We may do services differently. Maybe a more modern touch to them. Maybe a bit more contemporary. We may reach our community a little more effectively and a little, little more directly. But somehow being served has stayed there for many people. What's in it for me at church? What am I getting out of this? Do you realize that it's possible to serve with the wrong motives? You can do the right things in the wrong way and it's still wrong. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 tells us this, if I speak with tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong. I, I, I like that. It's speaking about uh, spiritual gifts there. And it says, if I speak in tongues of men, and it says, and even of angels. Who would like to speak with tongues of an angel? We'd like to speak in the tongues of an angel. That'd be a wonderful thing to do. But you know, if we have not love, that's just like a resounding gong, a resounding symbol to do that. We can have the right form, but we can have the wrong motive behind it. We can have the form of speaking in tongues of men and angels, but we can have the wrong substance to it when we have that. The context that we're looking at today and considering service, the substance of service, is what we're looking at, the substance of it, not the form of it. I'm not talking here about the good deeds that we do, the good acts that we do, whether I do this or whether I do that. Those things are important. Those things are important, but I'm not talking about the things that we do. I'm talking about the motive behind what we do and what we do within that. Jesus said and reminded his disciples in Mark 10 that we need to serve others, not ourselves. Our attitude needs to be not in getting service for ourselves, but offering service to others. It needs to be not serve us, but service. We can have an attitude of, I'm going to do something because I, I want it done a certain way. Or we can have an attitude of, I'm going to do something because I like it done to my satisfaction. That's the wrong attitude. We're supposed to serve when we serve one another, when the Bible calls us to serve one another. We need to have an attitude of service, not serve us. Jesus wants to move us away from that attitude of serve us to service. And there's three things I see, and if you take your Bible and open it once again to the New Testament book of Galatians, 
chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. And there we read it. You are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. This is the explicit teaching of service for one another. Serve one another in love. The implicit, the implied one was Mark chapter 10, where Jesus implied you serve one another. Here it specifically says, explicitly says, serve one another. And there's three aspects of serving one another that I see here. One is we are called to serve. And what's the call to service? It's freedom. We're free to serve. Jesus, if Jesus' words in Mark 10 are implicit, these are explicit. But we have been called to serve one another because we are free to serve one another, not obligated to serve one another, not, not, not uh, compelled in a, sense, in a sense of a negative sense of being compelled in that. We're free to serve one another. That may sound like a strange statement that we're called to be free to serve one another. But when we realize that if we're left on our own, do you know what our natural tendency is? Serve self, serve self. The sinful nature is to serve self. We can be, in, a fa in fact, slaves to serving self. And what do we mean when we say Mark says, we are, the, the Gospel of Mark says that we are slaves? That's a natural and even more valid question when, when he says, what do you mean we're slaves? He says, we, we grew up and we were Abraham's children. And even when we were held in Egypt, we knew we weren't fully slaves because we would come out one day. You would deliver us, God. We're no, no one holds us captive. We're your people. We're not slaves that way. And so being free meant, meant lots to these people to do that. Also in Romans chapter 6, we see, For we know that the old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. And we should no longer be slaves to sin. Sin leaves us to serve self. But the old self has died. The new self has been born again. And we're free to serve one another in the way that Jesus has called us to serve one another. The concept of freedom meant a lot in the Greek culture. Though they had slaves of their own, to be a free person as a Greek person, as a Greek person meant everything to them. You didn't want to be owned by anyone. You didn't want to be held captive by anyone. You needed to be free. So as they're sharing this about serving one another, being free to serve one another, they had a high concept, a high opinion of what freedom was and that slavery was scorned at, slavery was rejected for these people. And when you're called slaves to sin, they didn't like that. But you've been freed from that. And being freed from sin, we're free to serve one another. This word serve is a direct derivative of the word for slave. When we serve one another, it's a direct derivative of the word for slave. In other words, we are slaves in serving one another. Not in a negative way, but that's how much committed I need to be in serving you, and we need to be to in serving one another. Serving denoted for these people some, some, some compulsory service. They, they were, uh, it was something that was required. We've had in past years in some countries, they have what they call conscription. Rina and I lived in Thailand for six, for six years. And every, every uh, uh, male child, and I believe it was between 20 and 22 years old, had to sign up for a conscription. Be conscripted. They could, get, they could uh, be fortunate enough to draw so that they wouldn't have to serve a long time or any time, but they had conscription. It was known to us during the time of the war that there was conscription. You were required to do this. In a sense, serving one another is like a conscription. We need to do this. We're free to do it. But we need to look at it as, if I call myself a follower of Jesus Christ, I need to be obligated to that. So we have the call to, to, uh, to serve, which is freedom. But there's also a motivation to serve. And that motivation is love. We see there in Galatians chapter 5, verse 15, where it says, You are called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in sinful nature. Rather, serve one another, how? In love. In love. The motivation needs to be love. Why should I serve you? Because I love you. Why should we serve each other? Because we love each other. Where does that love come from? It comes from God himself. He loves us. We love because he first loved us, is what the, the Bible tells us. And we need to love in the same way that he has loved us. As the Apostle Paul said in 1st, 2nd Corinthians chapter 5, for Christ's love compels us 
because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again. Christ's love compels us. Why do I serve? Because Christ's love, if I have his love inside of me, that love drives me to compel me. Let me tell you something. If you serve for another reason besides the love of Christ within inside you, your burden, it's going to be a burden instead of a pleasure. It's going to be drudgery instead of warning, it's, instead of rewarding. It's going to be, seem useless instead of purposeful. It's going to be, seem empty instead of fulfilling. If you have that not, if you're not serving out of love, that's what happens to serving. It turns into a drudgery, the things that you do. Well, we have a call to serve, which is our freedom. We have a compelled, we're compelled to serve. The motivation for serving is, our, is love. But we also have a power for serving. And the power for serving we have is the Holy Spirit. God empowers us. He instills power within us through the Holy Spirit so that we can serve. We're not called to do it on our own strength. We're called to do it on his strength that he imparts in us through his Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 7, verse 6. But now by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit, not in the old way of the written code. They were saying this new way was given so that you're serving in the strength of the Spirit, not in the following of all these religious laws and commandments. But through the power of the Spirit, we are able to serve Acts chapter 1, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and all of Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What's going to happen when the power comes on you? The gospel is going to spread. Here were these 12, if we call it, basically these, these 12 original disciples, if we want to call them that. They couldn't figure out heads and tails. They were dumb enough to say, would you do anything I ask to Jesus? But here, the Holy Spirit came upon them and empowered them, and we see that some even faced their death because the power of the Holy Spirit was in them as they served. The word serve that we find in, verse, in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 that we were looking at previously, it stressed dependence on the Lord. If we're going to serve, it stresses dependence on the Lord. The Holy Spirit gives us power in two ways. One is he gives us strength, and in the other way, he gives us enabling. He strengthens us, and he enables us. He, enables, he strengthens us with his power, and he enables us with spiritual gifts. He gives us the ability to do that, the strength to do that. And we need to appropriate both. We need to appropriate both his strength and his ability that he gives to us. The trouble with some people, though, is they receive the ability, they've got this spiritual gift, or they've got this gift or that gift, and they say, I'm so natural at this, I can just do it on my own. But God doesn't call us to that. As we serve one another in particular, he calls us to rely on his strength to so fill us and so enable us that we can, like Jesus said, whoever wants to be greatest among you is going to have to be a servant of all is going to have to be a servant of all. Each one of us must, with the help of God, pray about, discover, and then offer our body to Christ as a commitment to serving one another. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would take us from that attitude of serve us to serve him. To rely on the power that you give to us, that you give to us, both through the Holy Spirit. And if, Father, we could do so with joy because we have the right, the right motive behind us. We've got the, your love, the love of Christ instilled in us that's supposed to be shared with others. And if, Father, we are not bound by this, we, we need to do it, but we're not bound by it in a, in a, straight, in a, in a negative way. But, Father, we're free to serve. We're free to serve. We've been released of our sin that wants to serve self, and we've been given freedom to serve one another. Let us serve one another. Let us serve our community, Father. Let us see the needs in our community and service those. Let us see the lostness of our community and service that. Let us, Father, see our community 
through your eyes and be of service to them. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to close with a song that we haven't actually done in a number of years. I think it was actually Pastor Carolyn that introduced it to us. Um, but if you don't know it, then I would just encourage you to, to reflect on what it what is God asking you to do and who? <laughs> How might God uh, be asking you to serve others? So I invite you, if you're able, to stand. Let's sing. You have shown us, O oh God, what is good. From Psalm 29, hold all your hands and receive this from the Word of God as a blessing today. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Go in his strength, go in his peace, and serve one another. Amen. <laughs>